In today's Gospel reading, Jesus tells the disciples about his approaching death. We read that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. But this appears to be the first time that the disciples hear Jesus talk in this way about his coming death. And they are horrified. The text even tells us that Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But Jesus continues. He calls the large crowd of followers to listen along with his disciples. And this is what he says. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus is preparing his followers for the fact that his death is approaching. And in what he says in this text, he's giving them hints that it's not going to be any kind of death, but specifically death on a cross. And it seems very clear in our gospel text that the the disciples really struggle to understand, to accept, to grasp Jesus' meaning. And indeed, understanding the meaning of Jesus' death on a cross is something that Christians have struggled with ever since. Why did Jesus have to die? What did his death on a cross accomplish? And what can it possibly mean for us as Jesus' followers today to take up our cross and follow him? From a very, very young age, I was taught that Jesus' death on the cross was the most important event in human history. I was taught not just that the cross was central to the Christian gospel, but that the cross of Christ was the gospel. And I had a very clear understanding of this, almost forensic understanding of this. This was the mechanism by which we are saved. Jesus died on the cross in our place as a substitute to take the punishment for sin that we deserved to take that punishment on himself. It was almost like a formula in my childhood understanding. We are separated from God because of our sinfulness, but God loved you and me so much that he sent his son Jesus, who was without sin, to take our sinfulness on himself remove the barrier between us and God, and by believing this message about Jesus, we could inherit salvation, eternal life, and go to heaven when we died. This was the gospel. This was what you had to believe in order to become a Christian, and this, I was assured, was the thing that set Christianity apart from all other faiths, the thing that made it possible for Christians to have a special relationship with God. I believed that this had been an essential, universal, non-negotiable Christian doctrine for all time. Now, I wonder if that sounds familiar to any of you. Probably depends on the kind of Christian tradition that you were raised in. But for me, it wasn't until I went to seminary in my mid-30s that I learned that what I had been taught was a very specific and contested doctrine. And I learned that this doctrine has a name. The idea that Jesus was substituted or sacrificed in our place to take the punishment for sin that humanity deserved, that idea is called the penal substitution theory of atonement. Those are a lot of theological sounding words, but 
in this context, penal means punishment, like the penal system, the criminal system. Um, and the substitution is obviously Jesus taking our place. So penal substitution. And then a theory of atonement is just a fancy way of saying an attempt to understand the death of Jesus. So an atonement theory is an attempt to explain simply why did Jesus die? How did Jesus' death impact the world? And throughout Christian history, scholars and theologians and ordinary Christians have developed many different theories and metaphors to try to explain, to try to understand why Jesus' death on the cross was important and how Jesus' death changed the world or changed our relationship with God. And this penal substitution theory is just one of many theories of atonement that Christians have believed throughout the past 2,000 years. It has become the most dominant idea in certain Christian circles in recent years, particularly in the evangelical church. But it is not, as I was taught, something that all Christians have believed for thousands of years. In fact, it was developed in Europe during the 1500s at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Some other major theories of the atonement are the ransom theory. This is the idea that humanity was held hostage by the devil and Jesus paid the ransom price to set us free. If any of you are fans of the Chronicles of Narnia, that's the atonement theory that C.S. Lewis is writing out in metaphor there, where the white witch takes Edmund hostage and Aslan pays the ransom price to set him free. Or there is the Christus Victor theory, which just means Christ the victor or Christ victorious, where the work of the cross, it's not a substitution or a sacrifice. It's about Jesus' victory over the powers of sin and death. Death could not hold him down. He rose again. This theory focuses more on the power of the resurrection to defeat death than anything that actually happens in the moment of crucifixion. Another theory is called the scapegoat theory. And this is known as a non-violent atonement theory, meaning that in this idea, God is not vengeful or violent. God is not demanding payment for sin or using Jesus to pay a ransom. This theory focuses on Jesus as an innocent victim of human violence rather than as a sacrifice or a substitute. Those are just a few. There are many, many more of these theories that you can read about if that interests you. But more recently, some other theologies have developed and emerged as Christians have continued to wrestle, as Christians have always wrestled, with how to understand Jesus' violent death in light of our belief in a loving God and in light of the ongoing suffering that we see in our world. And one understanding that draws together many of these elements is the idea of the cross as God's identification with the oppressed. And this idea comes from liberation theologies and from the lived experience of people who have suffered oppression and violence, what Latin American theologians call the crucified peoples of history. People who have seen their own suffering mirrored in the suffering of Christ on the cross. Reverend Dr. James Cone who is a theologian who was based out of New York City, who died just a few years ago. He was known as the father of black liberation theology. And he wrote a book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. 
in which he argues that the crucifixion was very clearly a first century lynching. And Dr. Cohn says that the crucifixion of Jesus and the lynching of black Americans are so similar that one wonders what blocks the Christian imagination from seeing the connection. These liberation theologies, they draw a straight line from the suffering of Jesus to the continued suffering of real people today. And they challenge us to question how Christians who claim to follow a crucified savior have often been complicit in causing the oppression and suffering of others. In our gospel reading today, Jesus tells his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This metaphor of Christians taking up their cross doesn't make any sense if the cross is simply the mechanism for Jesus taking our sin on himself once and for all to pay the price, as I was taught. Rather than being this abstract mechanism of personal salvation, in liberation theologies, the cross becomes a reminder for us that Jesus always identifies with the oppressed. That Jesus will always critique those in power and those who abuse their power by enacting violence on the bodies of other human beings. And that when we claim to follow Jesus, we are called to do the same. Elsewhere in the Gospels, when Jesus speaks about his approaching death, he uses yet another metaphor. And this one is the image of a single grain of wheat or seed. And he says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Think for a minute about a tiny seed or a single grain of wheat. It seems so insignificant. When a seed falls to the earth and is buried by soil, it disappears completely. And covered in the soil, it could be quickly forgotten. But the seed is still there, doing its work in secret quietly and mysteriously growing. A single grain will fall to the ground and die, and yet it will bear much fruit. Those who oppose the kingdom of God will think they have destroyed it, buried it, only to find out all along that it was a seed, only to find it springing up unexpectedly, growing and thriving. The oppressive Roman Empire will think that they have prevented a revolution by executing Jesus, only to find his followers springing up like weeds all over the empire, continuing the subversive work that Jesus started. So if Jesus is the seed who will die and yet produce much fruit, then what if being a follower of Jesus is more about what we practice than what we believe. What if being a Christian means continuing this work that Jesus started rather than adhering to a very specific set of theological beliefs about exactly what happened at the moment that Jesus died on the cross? What if that is what it means to take up our cross and follow Jesus? Reverend Dr. James Cone says that when we recognize that God is on the side of the oppressed, ultimately good news of hope comes by way of the cross because God's story does not end with suffering but with resurrection. And he says that during the civil rights movement, it was Jesus' cross that sent people out protesting in the streets, seeking to change the social structures of racial oppression. If Christians claim to be people of the cross, 
We must continue this work of protest. We must speak out for the crucified peoples of history and the people who are still being crucified today. If we sing Lift High the Cross on a Sunday, then we must also declare that black lives matter every day of the week. In our text today, Jesus tells the crowd, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I think this is a particular challenge to those of us who are relatively safe or wealthy or privileged. The cross should inspire us to pray for God's kingdom to come, not by telling people who are suffering that they will get their reward in heaven after they die, but by working to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, even if that means giving up some of our power and privilege now. So the cross reminds us that Jesus always identifies with the oppressed. The cross reminds us to look at our neighbors and see the face of Christ. The cross reminds us to listen to the voices of marginalized people and believe them and follow their leadership and continue the work that Jesus began. Amen.